This is CPSC 526 lecture 3 on the topic of hash functions. So hash functions are these interesting and incredibly useful and incredibly prevalent constructions, tools in cryptography, and they come up in so many different places in so many different ways, and they ha seem to be so versatile in terms of their uses. Now, if you're already familiar with hash functions, you may be thinking of the kind that relates to a data structure, a hash table, something like that. And so in this lecture, we're going to be talking about cryptographically suitable hash functions and distinguishing them from non-cryptographically suitable hash functions. But the premise is the same, that you take some object, like a long string, and you hash it to get a very short concise representation with the goal being that the, the short representation that you get is somehow easily changed if you have different inputs, so two different objects will have different hashes. The key of a cryptographically suitable hash function is that there are, it becomes infeasible to find a value that will have a specific hash. So the goal being that given a hash, you can't ever figure out anything that would create that hash without simply trying everything brute force and seeing what actually happens to have that hash. So the hash value itself is also called a digest. And any time you take an object or a representation of an object, so you take an object, you convert it to a string, a binary string, you hash it, you get a digest. If you do that again, you'll get the exact same digest. So it is a function that always returns the same value every single time, that as long as you pass in the same input. But if you change a bit of it, it'll have a cascading effect, change many bits of the output hash. Hash functions are, of course, widely used. They're used in hash tables, for example. But cryptographic hash functions are also very widely used with many, many applications, both directly applied to cryptography and other other uses as well for having these kinds of robust hashes. So a hash function is an efficient hardware implementation of what in mathematics we would call a random oracle. And this is a concept of uh, an oracle, so an entity that you can ask questions to. And you ask a question, given a particular binary string, what is its what is its hash? What is its digest? And the oracle returns a random response if it's never seen that input before. So if, it, if you ask, what is the hash of the word hello? And it has never seen the word hello before, it just makes up on the spot something completely random. But if anyone else ever asks it hello afterwards, it will return the exact same thing. So it remembers exactly what it returned. But each individual response that it makes is entirely random. So it's entirely random response, disconnected in theory. This is the mathematical ideal that the hash of a particular binary string has nothing to do with the binary string. The oracle just checks to see if it's ever answered this question before, and if it has, it is consistent with the previous answer, and if it hasn't, it just makes up something completely unconnected from it on the spot. A hash function tries to implement this, because this random oracle is clearly not inter implementable, it won't scale well at, on the internet, for example, but we try to implement this concept of having some binary string hash, a digest, be able to be deterministically computed, but yet still look as though it had nothing to do with the input at all. That is, given the output, you cannot figure out what the input would be. So this slide just restates all this. Given a random binary, given a binary string that it's not seen before, generates something purely random, giving no information about the original string when you simply look at its digest. So as well, the random oracle is always available, can always answer questions. So it can, ideally, it works extremely fast. Anyone, anywhere can just hash a string and get the answer and importantly, never exposes the mapping of outputs to inputs. So you cannot ask the oracle, what is an input that would give this hash? 
The only thing you could do is does hello give this hash? Does goodbye give this hash? Does every single possible word or expression try them all until you find one that actually works? That's your only approach, this brute force strategy, or at least this is the ideal. So a hash function simulates a random oracle under computationally bounded assumptions. So information theoretic assumption would be this is a truly random string that is emitted, and the only way to find this hash is to know what the actual message that's being hashed is. A hash function, in contrast, is a function that anyone can compute, and they can compute it as frequently as they want, and behaves like a hash function, but if you had access to a great deal of computational power, you could reverse the mapping. You could figure out what output maps to what input. Of course, in the case of a true random oracle, if they've never hashed a string before, then it's not correct to say that this is the thing that hashes into that string because the random oracle has simply not created that randomness yet. So we want hash functions to act as random oracles. This means that the output looks randomly generated. So it, in principle, it would be mostly, or 50-50 zeros and 50-50 ones, that is, that each individual bit has a 50-50 chance of being either zero or one. Every single bit looks as though it's a, a coin flip. That it's deterministic, so the function, there's no randomness in the function. It, it looks like the output is random, but it'll always give the same output for the same input. So it's deterministic, though it looks random. And it's impossible to predict the input for a given output. So if you are given the hash of something, it tells you no information about what, inputted, what was inputted to create that hash. And another way of thinking about this is, if you give it an input your best way of figuring out what the output is, the, what the hash is, is simply to run the hash function. That given the input, your best strategy for computing the output is to execute the function, not to do something else, not to do an analysis or something. But of course, if we implement this as just a simple algorithm, then a hash function is an algorithm that anyone can execute as often as they want, which means that there are these brute force attacks. You can simply try different messages over and over and over and over and over, and eventually you'll find one that actually matches the hash. Because the existence of a hash function as being an algorithm means all of the possible hashed values are already known. The, the algorithm, in a sense, already knows what it's going to say given a new input it's never seen before. That's already established simply by running the algorithm. And so if you want to find a string that match, that hashes to a particular value, you can just try every possible string until you find it. So the three goals for a cryptographic hash function I have listed here, they are pre-image resistant, second pre-image resistant, and collision resistant. H1, the pre-image resistant property, also known as the one-way property, is given the description of a hash function H and a value Y, such that Y is equal to the hash of some X, that is, given the co implementation of a hash function and a hash, a value that is outputted by it, it is computationally infeasible to compute x. Computationally infeasible here, meaning you could try all possible values and you'll find one eventually, but it is not possible to do that, say, because there's too many possible values to try, so brute force takes too long, you would spend too much time doing the computation. This is the idea of having computational limitations. So, Given the output, you can't find the input. This is the main function that we've been talking about thus far. Second pre-image resistant is a slight twist on H1, and that is, given the description of a hash function H and X, 
it is computationally impossible to compute x prime not equal to x such that h of x1 or rather h of x prime is equal to h of x. So here, the subtle difference, in h1 we were given the output, the goal was to find the input. Here, we're given an input, and we're asked to find another different input that collide, that have the same hash value. And the constraint that x prime is not equal to x is that trivially, the same value would produce the same output, so we want a different input that hashes to the same value. And a key point here is that the hash functions that we implement, these digests, these are short representations. So hash functions have outputs of 128 or 192 or 256 bits. But the things they can hash is any binary string of any possible size. So all possible binary strings can be passed in as input to these hash functions. We can compute the hash of a file, we compute the hash of a operating system's image that would be flashed onto a mobile device. We can compute the hash of a computer program's executable code. We can compute a hash of a simple string. All of these things, regardless of their size, are eligible to be passed in to these hash functions. But the output is going to be, say, 128 bits or 256 bits. Which means that there's going to be lots of other values for any particular message x. There's going to be an infinite number of other possible x primes that have the same hash. The goal is that it's computationally infeasible to find them. That is, the only way to do it is to try hashing every possible thing until you finally find one. And the last property is collision resistance. And that is that given the description of a hash function h, it is computationally infeasible to compute x and y such that h of x is equal to h of y. This condition, collision resistance, is actually surprisingly important. Now, at the end of this lecture, we'll touch on a few reasons why. But it also seems extremely unlikely. Just one collision, given a hash function that anyone sees the code for and can see how it works, it being computationally infeasible to find any two different values that have the same hash, given the entire description of the hash function and being able to have full freedom in what these two values are. It's not that we're having a message m and we're trying to find another message m prime that have the same hash, but rather we're any two values that we can possibly find that happen to have the same hash, we want that to be computationally infeasible. As well, h3 implies h2. And I put brackets around that, why is that? So you could think about that for a moment. H3 implies H2. And the reason is because H3 represents, in, in a sense, this um, re relief from the constraint of having a specific X. Right? If we have x and we can find x prime that have the same hash, that is by virtue of having the same hash, a collision. The difference which with h3 is that we don't even need to find a colliding value for a specific x. Any two values that collide is fine. So as we alluded to, a hash function is a mapping from all binary strings, so 0, comma 1 to the star to a fixed length string 0 comma 1 to the say 256 so it's a mapping from arbitrary binary strings the entire space of possible binary strings or in a sense data any possible data to a 256 bit representation of it now in practice these hash functions work by iterating over the message so the message has some arbitrarily long length, it's divided into blocks, and then each block is processed in sequence where there is some state that's maintained between each iteration. So there's an initial value, 
and the initial value is combined with a block to produce a new, uh, a, 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 the next value, which is passed into the next one in the same way that CBC mode works, where you chain the output to be combined with the input for the next one. And then the state itself is then becomes the output at the end. So once you're done processing the message, the state is the output. So this is known as the merkle damgard construction. And the nice property of the merkle damgard construction is that it makes the job of mapping all, any possible binary string into a fixed length one easier to do. Because now, instead of having to worry about how to deal with any possible binary string, you just need to figure out how to deal with a string of length 2n. So you have a secure, that is, achieves properties h1, h2, and h3, compression function. Now this compression function maps strings of, the length, of length 2n to strings of length n, and you just keep re applying this compression function over and over and over until effectively going through the entire binary string. So no matter how long it is, if it happens to be um, 10n long, then you would apply this compression function nine times, and then you end up at the end. In a sense, it has the number of bits from the message in a collision-resistant one-way manner. So this construction takes two n-length inputs. It's, we, we call it an IV, initialization vector, and a message block. And it produces one n-length output, which is the hash. So if you wanted to hash an entire message, which might be really long, you first add zeros to the message until it's block aligned. That is, its length is a multiple of n. Then you take some fixed initialization vector, I, we call it iv, you pass it in, and the first block to the compression function, use the output of the compression function as the iv for the next round, and then you output the final result. And here I've just given a little algorithm for this iterating hash. Divide the message into n blocks. Start, you have an initial state cur is equal to the iv, then for i is 1 through n, you cur is equal to cur, hash of cur, comma, b sub i, the next block of the message return cur. Right, where h in this case is not the hash, rather, but the, the compression function that we were talking about. So now we can implement a hash function for arbitrarily long messages by first building a h1, h2, and h3 achieving compression function, and then using the merkle damgard construction to extend that those properties to arbitrarily long messages. The MD construction guarantees that if the compression function is collision resistant, then the hash function is collision resistant. And that makes it easier to design and build these hash functions when all you have to now do is design a collision resistant compression function. So standard hash functions are using the merkle damgard construction. So any hash function that's ever been involved in your security on the internet or for doing any other of the applications of hash functions are almost certainly going to be one of these three. MD5, SHA-1, and SHA-256. It's the same construction that's been being used uh, for, for many decades, and we keep improving the hash functions, but we're still using the same construction. So at the core, all of these hash functions, they're just a secure compression function iterating using the merkle damgard construction. And I just wanted to illustrate the actual MD5 operation. So normally I, in lecture, I would just draw this now on the blackboard and go through one round just to show you that the way these are implemented, in a sense, the, the sort of magic of these, of of cryptography when we when we get down to it it's really basic simple operations there's there's nothing particularly fancy happening so here we have a b c d which corresponds to the the iv in a sense the, the initialization vector at the very top we write it out as a b c d each of these are 32 bit numbers and then we do 
a number of rounds. We do 64 for the MD5 hash function. We do 64 rounds like this, where we do an operation and we end up with the next value. And then we do the exact same operation and do it again and again and again and again, 64 times, and then we're done. So this operation, the value of B becomes C, the value of C becomes D, the value of D becomes A. So that's all very straightforward. The value of B is equal to A XORed with some function computed on B, C, and D, XORed with or rather addition modulo 2 to the 32. So the, the red box with a plus in it, that's addition modulo 2 to the 32. So just dis, or discard any carry bits. So it's A, and you add to it, ignoring carry bits, some function f computed on b, c, and d. And then you add to it the message block for i, where this is the, the current round. Then you XOR in some fixed constant k. And then you do a bit shift, and then you add in b again for some reason. This is the art of creating these functions. And that becomes the new value of b. You do this 64 times, and you're done. The function f is bitwise operations. And it's this combination of doing logical operators and using arithmetic operators like addition that makes it hard to analyze, that we can't we can't come up with nice closed form expressions to describe at the end that this is equal to this plus this plus this times like we can't do that break that down mathematically and this is why it's not possible to compute the output given the input because this function f that gets used is a nonlinear function that's basically ands ors xors nots of the bits of the input and this is what prevents the combination of arithmetic operations and logical operations is what makes this hard. And the constants themselves, they, to look at them, they seem almost arbitrary. 7, 12, 17, 22. 7, 12, 17, 22. Those are the different round constants as you're going through it. This would be used at the k sub i part of this edition. So this simple implementation seems to work. Now, MD5 is no longer secure, but SHA-1, which replaced it, is pretty much the same thing. It's just there's more, it's, it has a larger output, so it's 192 bits, and the constants are different, but more or less it functions in the, in the same sort of way. And, and so too with SHA-256. It's just this basic idea of applying linear and arithmetic or, or logical functions back and forth, back and forth, many, 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 many times until you call it a day and say, we can't analyze this anymore. SHA-256 is what should be used for any time you need a hash. Of course, all these things can change. We could find out a, uh, an attack against this tomorrow. But for now, SHA-256 is considered secure for all purposes it is used H1, H2, H3, as far as we know. SHA-3, which is a, a separate kind of hash function, this is not part of the Merkle-Damgard construction lineage, it uses a different construction. It's called a sponge construction. So it behaves differently, it works differently, and in a sense this was developed with the goal of having a different kind of technology for hash functions available. So we would have, for instance, in case something ever went wrong with the basic design of SHA-1, SHA-256, that lineage of hash functions, if ever we found a fatal flaw in all of them, we would have a backup. We would have a standardized, already widely accepted, already widely implemented thing that we could just switch to at that moment to fill in the need for a, a secure hash function. And uh, for reference, by the way, SHA stands for Secure Hash Algorithm, and MD5 is the fifth version of the message digest function. So what are some of the uses of these hash functions? Well, one is this unique digest. 
you have a unique way of representing some data or state. You can have unique file names. For instance, if the file name was the hash of the data that was being stored, then you would never need to worry about accidentally overwriting your data or replacing the wrong file or what have you. Because if the file already exists, that name already existed, it means you are already storing this data and that allows you to deduplicate data in cloud storage. So if two people want to store the same file, the same picture, you just hash the data, store it there, you can see if you've already if you're already storing that data, you don't need to store it twice. You can this also allows you to have these distributed hash tables where it's acting like a key value store where different servers on the internet are storing different portions of it. So you could say, hash all the data, and this machine stores all of the values that begin with two zeros, and this computer stores the ones that begin with zero one, and then this one stores one zero, and this one stores one one. So you look at the first two bits, and then you know, okay, uh, which four computers you need, which of the four computers you need to go to to find who's storing your data, right? Then you don't need to worry about figuring it out like that. You just know, you just as long as you have the hash, you can go and look it up on these distributed hash tables. The software Git, if you looked at the version logs, it's using hash to uniquely identify every single revision. We also use hash functions for public key signatures. If you recall, I said that we don't typically use public key crypto to encrypt all of the messages or to generate signatures for the entire messages. Instead, what we do is we hash the message to get a very short digest, a concise representation, and then we sign that hash. So by signing the hash, we're saying that we are signing the message that produces this hash. But we know because of the fact that there are an infinite number of collisions for any particular hash value. We are, in effect, signing every single other possible value that has the same hash. And you might think, well, one will look like a message that we can read and, you know, makes sense and is written in English, but the rest will all just be random binary noise. But in practice, you can embed many bits of information with things like blank lines, two blank lines versus one blank line, or two spaces versus one space, or using this word or using that word. Each of these little decisions can encode one bit of information. You do 128 of these decisions, and the number of possible messages that would otherwise be identical in meaning, there's now two to the 128 of these possible messages if you have 128 bits that you're, in a sense, creating able to play with to create different messages. And so each of those 128, you know, we can map that to a hash function. So there's 2 to the 128 messages producing 2 to the 128 hashes. We do it for 2 to the 129, we're going to have a collision. So these collisions aren't necessarily just going to look like random noise. We can create collisions that would, in effect, have the same meaning as the original message that we were attempting to collide. Of course, the only way to do this is brute force, trying every possibility. Trying, and the security of these hash functions is premised on the fact that this kind of brute force is simply not possible. You can use hashes to prove the order of messages. So if you wanted to say that I'm saying something that was that I, that occurred after somebody else said something else, you want to prove that there's this temporal aspect to it. Well, you could repeat verbatim the thing that they said. You could just take everything that they said and then add your thing on top of it. But now the messages will grow longer and longer and longer and longer. But the more efficient way of doing that is to include the hash. So Alice says a message M. And then Bob says a message M prime, comma, hash of M. And that, in a sense, points to what Alice said, that that message M is embedded as part of Bob's M prime, but without having to store all of the message M, just the concise digest of it. And you can't create a loop in this way, because if Alice produces a message M, 
the hash of the of that message M won't be known until Alice effectively concludes what that message will be. So Alice, for instance, could not create a trivial loop where the message includes a hash of itself unless she can break pre-image resistance. And similarly, it can't be the case that Alice's message M includes the hash of M prime from Bob, where M prime includes the hash of message M for the exact same reason. And you can draw this out and see wh what step of, in the hashing you would need to have this information that doesn't yet exist, which is why it's not possible. Now, of course, if they can break pre-image resistance, it becomes trivial. Another uh, reason that hash functions are used is for commitment schemes. So commitments are widely used in a lot of protocols. And the idea is that one party commits to a value. So they aren't saying it, but they can't change it. That value can later be revealed. But at the time that they make their commitment, they are committing to a particular value given the information that they have at this time. And if that if information changes, they can't change what they're going to say, what they're going to reveal, because when they reveal it, it won't match the commitment. Again, this is a computational bound because it's effectively implemented with a hash. So the commitment is the hash of the thing you're going to say, and then the revelation is the message that was hashed. You can't, if you, as, if you assume that uh, property H2, which is second pre-image resistance, once you've committed to a, a, a hashed value, you can't come up with another message that will have the same hash, a different message, then you have this property that your commitments must stand. Right? This allows you to effectively prove that you were bound to say something, that you stood by some remark before new information arrives. So an illustration of this uh, that I find useful is imagining a magician and a victim. So the, vic the magician says to the victim, pick a card. And then the victim says, the seven of clubs. Well, this isn't a very impressive magic trick because the magician can say your card is the seven of clubs and the victim is not really impressed. So what about this? The magician says to the victim, pick a card. The victim thinks, okay, seven of clubs, that's the card I'm, I picked, but he's not going to tell the magician. The magician just says, okay. The magician says, your card is a seven of clubs. You know, wow, an impressive magic trick. But now the victim is no longer the victim, just decides to lie and says, no, it was the seven of spades, and the magician is confused. So the idea of using a commitment here can solve this magic problem. Magician says the victim, pick a card. They pick seven of clubs. They say to the magician, okay, my card is, and they give the hash of the seven of clubs. And now the magician has an attack because we talked about brute force Brute forcing a hash function is not possible. You can't compute the pre-image, but there's only 52 cards in the deck. So in this case, the magician sh could compute the hash of the ace of hearts, the hash of the two of hearts, the hash of the three of hearts, and so on, until they finally get to the seven of clubs. And they'll see that the hash matches, and then they can claim that to the victim. So... This is the basic idea of a commit reveal protocol, but we see that it won't work if we have a small, a very small domain, because a brute force attack on a small domain will actually work, right? So the, here the victim would be thoroughly confused. But what you can do is instead throw in some randomness like the, the current time or some other random string at the start of garbage and then say the thing you're actually trying to commit to, and that prevents this brute force attack. Another use for hash functions is for message integrity, also known as checksums. And here the idea is you want to prove the entire message arrived correctly. So you download a gigabyte 
bits of Linux image that you're going to flash onto a USB stick, and you want to make sure everything downloaded right because you know if one bit's wrong, it's it's going to be trouble. So you get a hash of the entire image, and if you know what the entire if the hash should be, you can check it offline. Right. If any bit changes, even if a bit in the checksum changes, it will be noticed. Right. You will know that you have received the entire message correctly in its entirety. Now, importantly, these checksums are only designed to fight against accidental corruption. They used to be computed with uh, non-cryptographic hash functions, things like cyclic redundancy checks, CRCs. But frequently you'll notice you'll find MD5 sums or SHA-1 sums alongside files. And SHA-1 sum, MD5 sum, this is just what is all, another way of calling the, the output of a hash function. And it's also the name of the hash function of the program that executes the hash of a file. And this is only good for accidental errors because, for instance, Suppose that when you downloaded the tool md5sum that computes md5sums, the adversary interfered there. So maybe the adversary gave you a tool that is bad to compute md5sum. So every time you compute an md5sum, you're computing the wrong thing. When, when it has some code word that the adversary wants you to just download and accept, it outputs the wrong value. So you'll never get the right value. Or... The adversary can lie about what the actual correct MD5 value should be because you're downloading the file, you're also downloading the MD5 sum that you're expecting to see. The adversary could lie about what that value is. But in the absence of an adversary who's interfering, this will work to detect accidental corruption, that this bit accidentally flipped when you were downloading it or something like that, and that the file is no good and you need to you need to download it again. The way to compute a checksum if you're doing it on the command line. So you can cat a file. So take a file, you cat the file, pipe it into SHA-256 sum that produces the SHA-256 hash of the contents of the file. MD5 sum exists, SHA-1 sum exists. You can call the, these functions and pass in as command line arguments the files themselves. It'll compute the hashes of all these files. Or you can just, if you want to hash some string that you know, you can echo it. You can echo dash n, means suppress the new line. Otherwise, echo adds an extra new line that wouldn't otherwise be there. And any new character will change the sum, will change the hash in, in a very substantial way. So... If you add an extra character that wasn't in hello because hello new line is different than hello, you're going to get a totally different SHA-256 sum. So these are uh, the typical ways you could compute these values. So as we alluded to with the integrity checks, does this protect messages from being altered by Eve? Only if she's passive. If Eve is passive, she can't alter the messages. That's the rule of a passive adversary. Eve cannot alter the message, and so there's no, then they can't alter the hash as well. But if Eve can't alter the message, then you really don't need checksums for message integrity. Because in that case, you can just rely on the fact that Eve's not going to modify the message. So these checksums using hash values as checksums, they protect against random bit errors, not deliberate ones. Because Eve can change the message and the hash so that when you hash the message, you see the hash that you're expecting. And it's these kinds of um, low probability faults are the things that adversaries can do. Right? If you imagine the channel as just randomly flipping bits, hashes will protect your message integrity. But if you imagine your channel as Eve deciding which particular bits get flipped, these are no longer random errors. These are low probability faults happening because Eve is intentionally interfering.
But we can use hash functions to compute or to provide message integrity and authentic, authenticity of messages. These are known as message authentication codes or MACs. They provide the a guarantee on the authenticity of the message so you know who actually sent it. And in a way, these are the symmetric key or or the standard cryptographic way of providing authenticity. And the public key way is these signatures that we talked about before. Signatures also allow Alice to know that this was written by Bob. And Max also allow Alice and Bob to know that they're sending each other messages, but they work a little differently. The idea is that with public key signatures, Alice can make a message that only Bob or that only Alice can uh, uh, Alice can create a signature that only she can create and everyone else can verify. With message authentication codes, it's there's a group of people who know the key, Alice and Bob, and anyone with the key can create and verify messages. In the same way with like AES, anyone with the key can encrypt or decrypt a message. With symmetric key message authentication codes, anyone with the key can compute the tags or these these Macs, or and as well verify that a particular tag or Mac is correct. This gives epistemic evidence for the two parties about who wrote the message, because Alice knows, for instance, that Alice didn't write a message. So if Alice receives a message and a Mac for that message, and she knows she didn't write it, and she knows that Bob is the only other entity with that key, she can conclude that Bob wrote the message. And Bob can do the same reasoning on his side. Simply by knowing they were not the ones who created the message, they're able to determine that the other person insofar that they're the only other entity with that key, was the one who created the message. But unlike public key signatures, they are not non-repudiable to outsiders. If Alice signs a message, everyone can verify the signature, meaning that a judge can say, yes, Alice signed this message. There's no way for Alice to say, I never did that. Whereas with Max, that is possible. If Alice computes a Mac... She can't go and tell Charles that Bob was the one who macked this message. Charles would say, well, it could have been you or it could have been Bob. I, I don't know. Both of you had the key. So the security properties that we want for Max are the following four. We want them to be secure against existential forgery, selective forgery, verifiable forgery, and key recovery. So, the idea of existential forgery is that an adversary without knowledge of K should not be able to compute a valid tag T for any message M. So we have a message. Max are based around a key. A tag is the output, is the, is the Mac itself. So a way of thinking about this is as though it's a keyed hash function. So with a message and a key, you can compute the tag. But if you don't have the key, you cannot produce a valid tag T for any message M. That's existential forgery. And we see that this is an easier one than the next one, selective forgery which is that an adversary without knowledge of K cannot compute a valid tag T for a particular M. So existential forgery is the adversary can't compute any valid message comma tag pair without knowing K. Selective forgery, the adversary cannot compute the tag for a particular message without knowledge of K. Verifiable forgery is that an adversary without knowledge of K cannot determine if a tag is valid. 
So an adversary can't simply look at a message, look at the tag, and decide this is a valid tag or this is not a valid tag. And finally, key recovery is the adversary figures out, okay, we don't want that to happen. So say an adversary with thousands of messages and there are thousands of their corresponding tags should not be able to look at all of the messages and tags and run some algorithm and pull out K from that. Because, of course, an adversary who could do key recovery could then do all of the other attacks trivially. Because with the key, we're assuming that Alice and Bob can compute tags for messages with key. If an adversary could pull out a key just by looking at messages and tags, they could then do unlimited existential forgeries, selective forgeries, verifiable forgeries, and so on. So how do we implement these MACs? The main idea is that we somehow hash the message and a key together. This is this idea of a keyed hash function. The tag, the MAC, is just the output of this hash. And the security is based on the key being secret. If the message changes, the hash will be different. So an, an adversary who knows a message and a tag can't figure out the tag for another message unless they know the key. So how do we actually implement this? Well, there's a, a number of ways we could try. So let's imagine we take the key K and we hash K followed by M. If an adversary knows M and hash of key concatenated with M, could they compute the hash of key concatenated with some M prime not equal to M? Well, it turns out they can, at least for the Merkle-Damgard construction. Because note that the Merkle-Damgard construction, the output of a hash function is the output of repeatedly applying this compression function block by block until you get to the end. But at every step along the way, the input to the next hash function, or the input to the next compression function, the IV, is equal to the hash output from the previous compression function. And when you reach the end of the message, that what you're left with becomes the hash. So given the hash of key concatenated with message M, you could append more information to the message and be able to figure out the hash of the key followed by the message followed by that extra stuff that you're adding. Because you already know the hash of K concatenated with M and you simply use that as the IV when hashing M prime. And the output, as dictated by the merkle damgard construction, will match. So these are known as message length extension attacks. The idea is that if you have a message M and its tag, you can compute any other message that's just stuff added to it. Now there's a caveat there where these hash functions work based on the size of blocks, say 128 bits. Well, the message would have to be perfectly block aligned. So if it wasn't block aligned, you couldn't necessarily do this attack. So let's think about this attack for a moment, length extension examples. So as an example of why such an attack would be bad, right, suppose your message was attack at dawn, and then Eve would be able to append stuff to it that might contradict what it said in the first place. So if an attacker can append something to a message that has the effect of undoing things that were said, it would have quite an impact. 
right? If you think about an HTTP GET request, you're getting a particular field, or you're getting a particular URL, and then there's these optional query parameters. Field 1 is equal to true, and field 2 is equal to 12, and so on. Well, a message length extension attack here could add something extra to field 2. Or it could add an entirely new field that wasn't otherwise there. And in fact, it could say field 1 is equal to false. And does that mean that field 1 is interpreted as false or as true? Well, that now it depends. It depends on how the server is implemented as to whether or not it, when it's reading through the algorithms, updates field 1 is equal to false without realizing it, that was already set to true. Unspecified behavior. And these are all possible for Eve to do just by doing length extensions. Let's look at an example with some code. Here I have some Python. There's a class. There's a function in it that prints good. S is some class, S dot good. Well, a length extension attack could add a new, entirely different function, evil, and redefine S dot good to be that evil function and call S dot good again, and now we'll actually call the evil function. So we want to avoid these length extension attacks. So what about the reverse? Instead of the hash of the key followed by the message, what about message followed by the key? Any problems here? Well, suppose that M collides on M and M prime. If an attacker has a tag for M, they will then have a tag for M prime. So if we use this as our as our macking algorithm and the attacker is able to retrieve an m and a, a a particular tag for message m and can compute collisions for m everything that they find that collides with M, they'll also have a valid tag for. So any message they can come up with that collides, they'll be able to get accepted as a valid message. Now, of course, this shouldn't happen, right? We design these hash functions to not be, to not exhibit this property, to be collision resistant and second pre-image resistant. But still, if we can protect against this from happening, why not? Why, why increase the risk unnecessarily? Right? We know that this can exist, so if we can even stop this attack, even though it should be unlikely, all the better. So for that, we use HMAC. And HMAC is what always should be used in these situations. So if for any reason you ever find yourself having a secret key, and hashing it with a message by doing some concatenation or seeing someone else doing this, you need to tell them to stop, tell them to use HMAC, or at least explain to you why HMAC is not the appropriate solution. Because it's almost certain that if you're hashing a key, you're doing it wrong. And this is why we have these time-tested tools. HMAC is the time-tested tool. It defeats all known attacks, assuming that H is a secure hash function. And its implementation is that you take the hash of the key and you XOR it with this first value, OPAD, and you concatenate it with the hash of the key concatenated with the iPad, followed by M, and all of that hashed. So, bit clunky, bit awkward, but this is known to defeat all, or this is believed to defeat all known attacks, as long as H is a secure hash function. Another uh, 
noteworthy, time-tested tool for applying these functions is when you're encrypting a message to, and you want to add authenticity, you want to encrypt it and you want to provide a Mac for it. And there's a number of different ways you can actually do this. You can encrypt the message first. You can Mac it first. And for reasons that we won't be getting into, the approach is encrypt then Mac. So you encrypt the message with the key. You then HMAC the ciphertext, not the plain text, and then you append the Mac to the ciphertext. So you encrypt the message, you Mac the ciphertext, you send the ciphertext concatenated with the Mac. So let's talk about collisions in hash functions. When a hash function collides, when it has a collision, that is any two messages that has the same hash, what do we do? We throw it out and we start using a new one. If we find one collision, it's no good. MD5 has a collision. SHA-1 also has a collision. That's why we don't use them anymore. We can use them for things like checksums or something, but not for anything security related. Because when a hash function has a collision, even just one pair of messages that has the same hash, it's no longer any good as a hash function. Here's a collision for MD5. It's subtle. It'll take a moment or two to see. I think the first difference is in the right half of the second row, 200 versus 202. Much of the message is the same, but this collision exists. They have the same hash. We have to throw away MD5. Which raises the question, why is having just one single collision so bad? Well, first, having one collision suggests that there is a technique to find collisions. In that, collisions are typically not found by doing brute force attacks, but rather through clever cryptanalysis of the actual functions to figure out some way of mapping input bits to output bits under certain constraints such that this message and that message will have the same hash. So if it were purely brute force, then finding a collision wouldn't suggest that we would be finding more collisions. But in practice, finding a collision suggests that there's some cryptanalysis on the function that is advanced to such a state that now finding collisions is possible. Second, and this relates more with the merkle damgar construction, which is that collisions in the compression function create more in the hash function. If we find collisions in the compression function, we now have collisions in the hash function, right? In particular, if the hash of x and the hash of y are the same, and suppose x and y are block aligned, then the hash of x concatenated with z will equal the hash of y concatenated with z. Because we can just keep adding more stuff after the fact. Recall that merkle damgaard construction. The output of one block becomes the IV for the next block. Well, if the output of hash of x after processing x is the same as the output for after processing y, both will be the same input when they process z, and z is the same for both of the messages, so the ultimate output is also the same. And so if a victim is willing to sign some message xz, it is as good as a signature for yz. Right? Because when we compute a signature on a message, we are signing, using public key crypto, the hash of that message, meaning that we're signing every other message that has the same hash, which is why these collisions can be bad. Now, X and Y might be entirely nonsensical. They might not be meaningful messages. And in fact, in the collision that we saw here, if you reproduce this as ASCII, if you take the hex and turn it into ASCII, you're not going to find anything that means anything by looking at it. 
So, hopefully, that would make it these collisions less valuable. But in practice, it's not the case. So, for example, PostScript, which is the printer format, has if constructions. And so you could have something like if x is equal to y, print the good document, else print the bad document. And the, this could be the entire document. Now, it will only ever print the good document. And here, when I say print, it doesn't need to be printed out on a printer, just print to the screen, right? PostScript is a similar format like PDFs. So when you view the document on a computer, you'll see the good document. But suppose that the entire quote of if open bracket x hashed to the same value as if open bracket y, where x and y, they're just totally random noise, right? The x and y are precisely these values, right? Where they don't mean anything, they just happen to exist. Well, the hash of if, if, if that first part until the end of x matches then what's going to happen here? Well, then what we'll have is that the alternative document, if y is equal to, equal to y, print good, else print bad. And I see it now I've actually flipped these, these two cases around. So the, the document on the top will print the bad one. The document on the bottom will print the good one. And both of these documents are going to have the exact same hash. Meaning that if someone was willing to open the document on the computer, digitally sign it, send it to a judge, the judge sees this document, that's fine. But the attacker who got that signature could then instead pass the other document to the judge or to some business that results in them getting some money or some immediate consequence of this and the fraud might be detected after it's too late. So even though the documents themselves aren't colliding on the content of the document, they're colliding because these documents are, in a sense, programming languages to themselves. Microsoft documents have macros, and they would work the exact same way. There's code that runs that changes how documents look, and you can insert these if-like constructions in that code and produce different documents with the same hash by algorithmically creating it. So MD5 was known to be weak, to be vulnerable to these collisions in 2004. Ideally, we would have stopped using it, but that's not what happened. It was still used for certificates, which underpins security on the internet as we, as we deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis, in 2008. And we're going to be talking about certificates in a full lecture later. But in a, in, a, in a sense, certificates are just signatures. And the signatures were using MD5, which means it was trivial to create fake certificates. You could create fake certificates so people were thinking they were connecting to the legitimate website, they were connecting to the attacker's website. Microsoft, a software company, they were still using MD5 in 2012. And so you might think, well, not for anything important, for code updates. They were signing code updates that people would install on their computers to get new code that would then run on actual computers. And the only security mechanism was a signature from Microsoft on an MD5 hash. The US and Israeli governments used this to create the flame malware which was then used to targ target Iranian nuclear program, as was revealed uh, in top secret documents that were eventually made public. So eventually we did switch to SHA-1. But in 2017... 
Shah 1 was broken. Because the PDF file format allows you to specify a background color, and these attackers were able to create two documents with the exact same hash that differed in this background color. And this is not as incredible a feat as a full if construction, where two different documents are printed entirely, but it is completely possible to, by changing the background color, hide some text and make other text appear. So it would have the same effect of being able to create two different documents by altering the background color. And very soon after this time, browsers promptly got rid of SHA-1. So shortly after this was made public, Chrome considered any website with a SHA-1 certificate as insecure. So you wouldn't see the nice lock icon if you went to a SHA-1 protected website or a, a, a website whose certificate was a signature based on a SHA-1 hash. And Firefox as well deprecated it the next month. So these collisions are impactful. A single collision in a hash function can make everyone's web browser stop using that hash function for all of the security purposes as it relates to the internet. And, as we saw in 2017, do it extremely promptly. 